Hello, I'm Brooke Longmate speaking from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm a physician in Massachusetts in the United States, and I'm welcoming you to the HEDRA Conference on Language in the Pandemic. My topic today, which I'll cover briefly, is healthcare communication in the pandemic. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy this, this brief presentation. I'd like to provide you a brief overview of what I'll be speaking about today. Healthcare communication is more than a dialogue with your physician. I'd like to briefly review the scope and impact of healthcare communication beyond the bedside, including the role of evolving healthcare models beyond the traditional physician-patient dyad and the resulting impact on communication and care. Briefly touch on the interplay between evolving communication technologies and generational comfort, the impact on healthcare connections. Also speaking about healthcare communication in critical settings, what we need and want in the darkest hours when we are in trouble. And the stars COVID-19 pandemic, its status and impact on healthcare communication and care. We'll be talking about these briefly. I'd like to just review how uh, marketing products and pharmaceuticals is shaped by communication. Communication is evolved in every healthcare interaction from the purchase of personal care products to critical care settings. Considerable advertising in some countries regarding non-prescription and prescription medications, particularly in the United States, uh, is a big impact factor in purchasing, but it is outlawed or significantly constrained in other countries. Accurate information presentation is essential, although varied in scope and type. Care may be compromised if care decisions are made on inaccurate, wrong, or biased information. Transparency regarding product science and performance is crucial, but not always available. For this reason, how new products and pharmaceuticals are evaluated and approved and marketed uh, is an important topic, but a separate one for another time. I'd like to touch briefly on the transactional nature of some healthcare interactions and the communications that occur or don't occur in that setting. Many healthcare interactions are transactional, the purchase of personal care products, birth control, and other lifestyle or wellness products. This may occur in person, such as in a drugstore or a pharmacy, or online. Relevant product information, including side effects, risks, and warnings may or may not be available or accessible at time of purchase, or the seller or the purchaser may choose not to review or discuss these. There's an implicit acceptance of risk by the user. There's an explicit risk accepted by the user in legal perspective if information about the product, including risks, is available and the, the uh, user chooses not to avail themselves of that. The care provider's role in communicating uh, regarding medication or other products prescribed or recommended is more complex and varied. In thinking about healthcare communication, it's important to evaluate the factors uh, influencing or affecting healthcare delivery. Healthcare needs and expectations, practice and care delivery are multifactorial and include where you live, healthcare system infrastructure and resources, funding, accessibility, societal expectations and cultural and ethnic factors patient age, patient gender, education, economic resources, family support, and prior healthcare experiences all play into the way that healthcare is perceived and delivered. Models of care, the traditional uh, provider patient in-person visits, possibly augmented by phone or social media connections, very important for many. On the other hand, virtual care provided via telephone or social media connections with use of apps to provide data historically acquired directly, such as vital signs, ECG tracings, cardiac rhythms, blood glucose monitoring, exercise and conditioning programs, diet, etc., are uh, the expectation of more um, uh, of the younger uh, folks who are not necessarily used to to having a traditional relationship uh, with a, a physician. There may be more transactional or shared decision model involved with this. The traditional dialogue in the uh, patient-physician dyad is one that is built on a relationship over time and oftentimes a somewhat paternalistic role of the physician. The physician is certainly committed to privacy and support of patient concerns, but may or may not acknowledge or even dismiss patient fears. Oftentimes the agenda of the interaction is physician driven. Uh, it is well known that there's uh, frequently a, a, a 20 second interruption of a patient's story. The physician asks why the patient is there. The patient starts to tell the story. The physician hears a particular statement or thinks about something they're concerned about with the patient and interrupts and takes the, the, the conversation in a different direction. The patient may not finish their story and why they're really there. P 
a physician may consider what information to share with the patient or family and may shape options for care based on the perception of the patient's ability or the family's ability to understand or process information or comply with recommendations. Physician may not consciously attend to patients' needs to be fully heard, including fears, concerns, questions about etiology, treatment options and side effects, and need for ongoing emotional support. Provider unlikely to have had training in healthcare communication unless it's been the last few years, or it's essential or understand its essential role within and the impact on care. I'd like to turn now to the essential aspects of healthcare communication in the direct face-to-face -face contact with the provider. At some point in our lives, we will all experience an acute life-altering or life-threatening illness or event for which we will require urgent or emergency care. Our first conversation may well be with ourselves, coming to grips with our critical situation and our looming distress, fear, or anger. Whether we suffer, survive, or thrive may depend on how quickly we can get to a care provider or facility with the resources to diagnose and treat our condition. At this moment of limited or no control, we feel vulnerable and frightened. We put our desperate hope and trust into someone or some place we may or may not know or have information about. Our initial interaction with those caring for us in such a setting will shape our perception of the quality of care and the trustworthiness of the team. Were we and those accompanying us seen and heard as we needed to be at that time when we were in crisis? Were we acknowledged and respected? We were shown compassion. Were members of the care team respectful to each other? Did care providers act in a professional manner to me and to my family and to others? Did they show commitment to excellence and transparency? Was there patience? Was there kindness? Was the availability of emergent care influenced by my ability to pay or the factors beyond facility resources, such as my ethnicity, my age, my gender? In other words, was care provided equitably across all ranges of patients presenting? In summary, was there a demonstration of humanistic values in your care at the time when you needed it most? In the last several decades, considerable work has documented the role of effective communication in healthcare and its effect on trust in the provider-patient relationship, patient compliance, care effectiveness, and safe or optimal outcomes. Healthcare communication skills can be taught, learned, and assessed. There are three main models, but there are others as well. The Calgary-Cambridge model by Jonathan Silverman and Suzanne Kurtz, now in its third edition. The Four Habits from Kaiser Permanente, as well as the Kalamazoo Essential Elements Communication Checklist. These are all discussed in detail in the book noted at the, uh, the bottom of the screen. For the last 40 years or so, there has been dedicated effort with research on and teaching of relationship-centered healthcare and the communication that's necessary in that by two different groups, the Academies of Communication and Healthcare, one in Europe and one in America, and they work together to share common uh, conferences on a yearly basis. I'm going to provide a brief summary of the research findings on improving clinical communication in healthcare. More effective consultations for patients and clinicians, resulting in greater accuracy, increased efficiency, and enhanced supportiveness and trust. Better relationships characterized by collaboration and partnership with patients and their providers. Better coordination of care within healthcare teams between other professionals with patients, significant others. Improved outcomes of care, including better understanding and recall, improved adherence and follow through, enhanced symptom relief, better physiologic outcomes, enhanced patient safety and fewer clinician errors, greater patient clinician satisfaction, reduced cost, shorter hospital stays, and fewer complications. In addition, there's reduced conflict, complaints, and malpractice claims. A good relationship through effective communication also provides the opportunity for physicians to admit they made a mistake or to say I'm sorry, and for patients to continue to trust in that care. Here is a paper published in 2014 in the Patient Education and Counseling, which is the official journal of those two societies in communication and healthcare. Uh, this is a paper uh, looking at the interprofessional global collaboration to enhance values and communication in healthcare through the International Charter for Human Values in Healthcare. You may find this of interest. The full 
article is downloadable for free, and the site is at the bottom of the page. I'd like to shift gears now and address the current pandemic and its effect on healthcare communication and care overall. I've provided here a comparison between the current uh, pandemic, a COVID-19 SARS-2 coronavirus, and the last pandemic, which occurred just about 100 years ago, the Spanish flu caused by an H1N1 virus, both spread by respiratory uh, means. Uh, the current pandemic had a rapid uh, global impact because of rapid, rapid travel and, and spread of the disease by, by people traveling uh, from country to country. The Spanish flu took longer to spread. The current pandemic started in December of 2019 and has been present now for about a year and a half. The Spanish flu lasted a little over two years before it started to, to uh, be less communicative. The Spanish flu affected approximately one third of the patient's population or approximately 500 million people. And of that, between four and 10% or 20 to 50 million deaths occurred. As of 5-18-2021, there have been approximately 165 million COVID cases with a little over 3.4 million deaths. Although the economist model estimates that real deaths is between 7.1 and 12.7 million, which would suggest a 2 to 7% death rate. The Spanish flu is not something that many remember, obviously, because of, of its long occurrence, but it was kind of under considered by historians because it occurred at the end of World War I, which overshadowed the, the Spanish flu significance at that time. As with any potential pandemic, proof of containment through epidemiologic means is essential. And the epidemiologist told us, N95 masks worn correctly, social distancing, isolation, or quarantining of those either expect, uh, suspected of being exposed or exposed, including exposure tracking and hand washing, are critical to, to slowing or stopping the spread of a pandemic. National and local lockdowns, travel limited, gatherings in social and life events, school closings, closings of restaurants, bars, and other social gatherings, critically important. Early surges with unclear pattern occurred in many places with a severity related to age and a variety of comorbidities, including obesity, diabetes, heart and lung disease. Respiratory compromise is the primary concern, but diffuse inflammation uh, within the organ systems and abnormal clotting mechanisms caused many deaths. Treatment protocols evolved over months with rapid iterations of protocols coordinated globally via websites that shared the results of some of the early work and in a much faster way than the traditional means of sharing only after something had been published. This allowed for more, more frequent and rapid iterations of, of, of medications that may be working and tried in multiple sites around the world. Many medications and other interventions championed, uh, but not all were demonstrated to be efficacious or safe or widely available, despite uh, promotion by many well-known political figures. The ultimate containment goal, of course, is widespread immunity, either through vaccination or natural uh, herd immunity acquisition by having the illness. Technologic advances are not prompt viral genome sequencing within within days after after uh, the cause of the pandemic was discovered, and then rapid development of vaccine via new mRNA technology, as well as vaccines uh, developed through more traditional means. Vaccine rollout has been dramatic, but uneven. Countries that funded the development received their first doses because they basically said, we paid for this, we get to have first dibs. Uh, the vaccines have been shown to be between 70 and 95 percent effective in preventing severe complications or death. And more recent data suggests that they also are effective in prevention. ID experts and epidemiologists estimate that 70 plus percent of the world's population must be vaccinated or have had the illness to achieve herd immunity. 
so as to slow and ultimately stop the transmission. And until worldwide immunization is achieved, the risk of mutations and reinfection exists for all of us. There are exemplars in the COVID containment. Uh, Taiwan, which is, which is geographically isolated island of 24 million people, has had only 2,017 cases and 12 deaths uh, as of the 18th of May, but is seeing a new surge. South Korea, with 51 million people, has had 132,000 cases and 1,904 deaths. China, with 1.44 billion people, has had 102,000 cases and only 4,846 deaths. There are challenges, uh, many people think, in the way that it is reported, and there are questions regarding underreporting by, by some countries. By comparison, Italy, with 60 million people, has had over 4 million cases and 124,000 deaths. The U.S., with 331 million population, has had 33 million cases and 586,000 deaths. India, with 1.38 billion people, has had 25 million cases and 278,000 deaths. And Brazil, with 213 million, has had 15 million cases and 436,000 deaths. The delayed or inconsistent use of masks and social distancing directly correlates with these surges, and it brings up the issue of, of compliance by populations, as well as effective leadership at the national and local levels to impress upon the citizenry of the importance for protecting themselves and others through effective use of masks and social distancing. The surges, we know, cause overwhelming of available resources, including protective uh, devices such as, as, as masks and shields and, and gloves and gowns, ICU beds and ventilators, oxygen, and we've seen the devastating effects of the lack of oxygen in India recently, as well as the availability of trained personnel, including physicians, nurses, aides, respiratory therapists, and others. And unfortunately, we've seen critically ill non-COVID patients turned away from facilities because they had no capacity to accept them. So these are deaths that may not be counted uh, as direct COVID deaths, but may be secondary to uh, the overwhelming of, of resources by COVID. Surges overwhelmed the capacity for systems in many regions, limiting the adequate care of both COVID and non-COVID patients. The requirement for isolation of hospitalized COVID patients and restrictions on all non-essential personnel meant that patients and their families or other supporters were separated and unable to be comforted by family. Limited communication with family, often through others, through caregivers, uh, when, when those connections could be made. Caregivers in masks, face shields, gowns and gloves became the de facto extended patient and family supports going in both directions with limited clinical backup or support. And of course, that led to emotional exhaustion from caregivers who were not only trying to keep the patients alive, but, but, but be the family members, members standing in for them. Um, and they, in turn, were isolated from their own families because of constant exposure. And the sheer volume of care demands led to, to compassion fatigue and depression in many caregivers. And sadly, too, it also often led to, to COVID in the caregivers either with illness or, in some circumstances, death, and increased number of suicides. The emotional toll on patients, families, and caregivers all suffered from the isolation from loved ones and all grieved the loss of loved ones who died alone and isolated. The ability of caregivers to communicate effectively with patients was limited by the, by the PPE, the social distancing, the background noise of an ICU, as well as the nonverbal means of communication, the facial gestures which were hidden by masks, the positioning, sitting on the bedside, putting your arm around the patient and touch. Exacerbation of grief and loss by inability to attend funerals or burials. This occurred both by, by family members and by caregivers. In many countries, bodies were kept in cold storage, extended periods of time in, in, in trucks outside the emergency department, or buried or cremated en masse. Recently, a number of bodies have been found in the rivers of India and they've been collected and cremated en masse or put into graves. Continued suffering from new infections and deaths will occur until vaccines are available worldwide to all who want them. What lessons did we as caregivers, patients, citizens, and leaders learn from this? And most importantly, how will we respond to the next pandemic? Because one will surely come. 
I would like to end this presentation by first thanking you for your participation and involvement. And secondly, to ask that you spend a minute reflecting on your healthcare experience that stands out for you. Maybe one that you had or that you had witnessed or heard about through a family member or friend. What about that experience makes it memorable? What about the experience would you change? How did the caregiver make you or family member or friend feel? Were you supported, respected, acknowledged, cared for? Did you feel compassion? Did you feel the professionalism, the transparency, the honesty? If you could, what feedback would you want to give the caregiver? Thank you.